Dear doctors and friends, I welcome you all to this presentation on tips and tricks of revision knee replacement. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Dr. Srikant Kayan, consultant knee and hip surgeon. These are my qualifications, particularly proud to have worked in Wrightington Hospital, the birthplace of joint replacement surgery in the world. I was formerly a consultant in joint replacement surgery and trauma in the UK. At presently, I am managing director of Sarthi Specialty Knee and Hip Center in Bangalore. I'm also a consultant in the court of corporate hospitals in South Bangalore, South Bangalore region. At the outset, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Meditube for giving me the opportunity to do this presentation. And in particular, I would like to thank Dr. Satish Bhatt for giving me the opportunity to do this interesting presentation on revision knee surgery. Experience relevant to this topic, I trained in UK in all aspects of orthopedics and trauma. I have specialist interest in computer assisted knee and hip surgery and patient specific implants. I did the General Medical Council of the UK recognized fellowship at Pima Teaching Hospitals. This is presentation of the fellowship by Dr. Jonathan Keenan, the director of orthoplasty at Pima Teaching Hospitals. So I was uh, in recognition of uh, excellence in knee surgery, I was nicknamed Shri the Knee, and this is a mark picture of me with a uh, cricket bat on my right hand side, one of my passions, and the revision knee is an uh, implant on the left hand side, another passion, with a beautiful Plymouth Harbor on the background. This is my second fellowship with uh, Dr. Ever Smith. Uh, this is a revision uh, hip and knee fellowship at Haven Orthopedic Center, one of the five specialist hospitals in the UK. And uh, Dr. Ever Smith is the UK head of European Hip, hip Society, and I also work with uh, Dr. Anthony Ward who is the director of pelvic vascular surgery for Southwest of UK. This is at Endoclinic with Prof. Gurkha, who is uh, one of the pioneers in uh, single stage revision of the hips and knees for infection. So uh, this was a septic revision fellowship at uh, Endoclinic Hamburg. I work with Dr. Richard Parkinson, uh, who is uh, uh, past the president of the British Knee Society. And uh, he's my mentor, and he inspired me to become a knee surgeon in the first place. He was the president of uh, British Knee Society from 2014 to 2016. He was voted one of the top 10 best knee replacement surgeons and trainers in the UK. Not surprising. As an introduction to today's topic, I would like to say that uh, totally replacement is a very successful quality of life improving uh, procedure. The number of totally replacements done in the world is increasing by fivefold from 2005 to 2030, as per the classic paper of Kurtz, which is uh, quoted in every orthoplasty meeting in the world. The number of revisions are on the rise because the primaries are on the increase from 35,000 knee replacements in 2005 to around 270,000 uh, knee replacements in around 2030. The leading causes of knee revision are <coughs> aseptic uh, loosening. 40%, pain and stiffness following knee replacement, 32%, focal osteolysis, 11%, and malalignment, 3%, instability, 18%, malalignment and instability are mainly surgeon factors, infection, fracture, or dislocation of the knee, around 3%. The information doubling time around 15 year, years ago used to be around 8 years for the amount of information in the world to double, but now, at the click of the button, the information doubles. And probably with this uh, corona infodemic, even before you reach the button on your laptop, the information doubles. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of conceptual change uh, in uh, the knee replacement surgery and uh, that has led to uh, probably increase in revision knee replacements. <clears throat> One is the J-shaped kinematics uh, of the knee. It was thought that the knee moves around uh, the J-shaped uh, kinematic inflection extension. But now it's been thought that, uh, you know, there is a transcondylar axis between the two epicondyles and, uh, you know, that's the true flexion extension axis of the knee. Mechanical alignment uh, of the knee replacement has given place to a kinematic alignment concept with the advent of uh, navigation and robotics. And now most of the top knee replacement surgeons agree that we have to aim for a Constitutional alignment that is around two to three degrees of uh, varus in the tibia, around one to two degrees of varus in the femur, not exceeding beyond four to five degrees combined varus. 
there are knees with the medial pivot design like the freeman sampson knee and there are knees which believe that the knee actually pivots around the lateral collateral ligament like the dgo knees there is a improvement in tribology of the knee and better material available now we no longer uh, use ultra high molecular polyethylene but we use a lot of uh, X3 poly, which is three times irradiated poly, which is highly strong, or we use E poly, which is vitamin E poly, which is again not only really strong but also long lasting. Similarly, stainless steel has given rise to more and more of use of uh, cobalt chrome and also to what is called the armor coat, which is uh, a gold coating that you see. Uh, and this is almost like a ceramicized metal, like a ceramic uh, implant. Totally replacement in the younger active population is increasing. What are these younger active patients? They are patients who are young, very active lifestyle. They are into hiking, mountain climbing, etc. And sometimes they are obese as well. So what are typically called as a millennium patient? In patients above 75, if there is a lot of uh, movement in the knee joint, uh, we expect that we, we get around 1 into 10 power of 6 cycles of movement in the knee per year but in less than 55 years old the number of uh, cycles is seven times this so naturally the wear and tear is more so revision rate in more than 35 is one percent per year but the revision rate in less than 55 is nearly two percent per year that means after five years after putting an a replacement in a patient a younger than 55 there is 10 percent chance of revision in a young person so in revision knee surgery, one of the key is to plan, plan, and uh, to know the enemy, what implant has been put. And there are a number of challenges. So the challenges could be like multiple scars in the front of the knee during the primary surgery. How do you deal with it? Other metal work, if it is there, legs plates, can you use navigation? Or if there is a nailing in the femur, can you use navigation? And if there is a nail and plate before, can you do the knee replacement in one stage or two stages? And if you've never seen this implant before, you know, how do we deal with it? So there is a website called optoimplant.com. You go that, you get a picture of almost every knee that's been used in the world. So how to remove uncemented metal back patella? It's again a challenge. Long stem revision. If there is a long stem revision, particularly the offset stem is very difficult to remove. We need to get a hip set and Oscar, and we might have to do, uh, you know, uh, osteotomies, uh, uh, like a fissiotomy in the femur or uh, tibial osteotomy, which I'll describe later to get the stem cell. So you need to plan properly for this surgery. You need to have tremendous patient as a surgeon. You need to have passion to do this surgery. It's not for everyone. You need to have a lot of perseverance and you need to have a proactive assistant who is not, you know, sleeping. And um, so they don't get a periprostic fracture during the revision surgery. So essential requirements are, necessary equipment like instruments, implants, and wraps. What are the surgical approaches? First step to any operation is a surgical approach. What are the approaches? The medial parapetal approach is the workhorse of a revision surgery. Basically, we need a big home. There's a limited role, or I would say no role for subvastus or misbastus approach. Many surgeons have tried, but you know, these only give benefits in the first two to three weeks, even in primary setting. And at one year, there's no difference between all these fancy approaches and medial parapetal approach. Rector snip is a very interesting uh, approach where you just take the top end of the incision of the quadriceps, you just take a one or two inches snip of the rectus to the lateral side, and this almost leads to a primary protein replacement outcome. Then there is more aggressive procedures, like if this oblique incision is carried further by few more centimeters into the quadriceps, it becomes a quadriceps turned down. Usually, leads to extensor lag. And there is a concept of banana peel, that's peeling the patella tendon with superior steel sleeve. Then, as I mentioned, there's a tibial tubercle osteotomy, that is around 6 to 8 centimeters or even 10 centimeters of the tibia is marked with a marker and, uh, you know, drill is used. And, uh, you know, with the drill holes, the saw blade is used and the, uh, a medial based, uh, lateral based flap is taken and the osteodomes are used in stacked fashion and lifted from medial to lateral side. 
with a lateral bony flap and then the stem is removed or the implant is removed and finally it's fixed back with either screws or circulage wires. So skin incisions with TKR, if there are multiple parallel incisions, use a lateral most incision as blood supply comes from medial to lateral side. You respect the old incisions, you try and maintain 67 centimeter gap between the incisions. And if you're in doubt, consult plastic surgeons like Dr. Sadish Bhatt, when in doubt, and anticipate possible flap coverage. You can use a gastrolimus flaps or even a lateralus dorsal flap if the gastrolimus is not available or tissue expanders can be used. So keep the skin flaps as thick as possible. So these are various extensile approaches. Uh, on the right side, you see the very well used uh, Vector snip where you go to the top end of the incision and just snip it in an oblique fashion towards the lateral side. The whole of the patella comes like an open book. So, similarly, cordyceps turn down, you know, you extend the incision further into the muscle, and they usually cause a lot of extensor lag and tolerate the effect of vector snip, which is almost gives a primary knee replacement uh, outcome. Exposure and revision TKI is very important. So, we can also do tibial tuberculosis osteotomy, which I mentioned before. It's called as a major exposure improvement and it uh, usually leads to delayed rehabilitation. So significant complications of uh, the tibial tubercle osteotomy is non-union, patellar tendon rupture, tibial fracture or sometimes skin loss. So only experience need to do and that's a loss. Resort, <coughs> this is how it is done. I mentioned you mark it with a uh, marker pen. You take uh, drill holes and uh, mark the medial side and connect all the holes with a saw. And then uh, pre-drill that uh, you know screws uh, holes or a SS wire holes, and then with the stacked osteoderm, lift it from the medial to lateral side, keeping the lateral uh, osteoperiosteal flap intact, and taking the whole patella everything as an open book. And then in the end on the right hand side, you see the closure and how SS wire is used to close it using the pre-drill wire holes. So what are the tips and tricks to implant removal? A good exposure is very much important. You know, 360 exposure of the femoral component and the medial component. So you need to clear the medial lateral parapetal better ruthlessly, otherwise nothing can be done. Best thing is to pin the patella at the beginning of the surgery to avoid avulsion because the patella tendon is gone, your surgery is as good as finished. Always with the osteotome or saw, you attack the cement implant interface, the strong interface, never the cement bone interface because the bone is the weakest link and you are trying to preserve the bone. Never liver on the bone because it could be having osteolysis or stress shielding and it may crack and you are trying to preserve the bone as I said. Patella, if there is a well fixed patella, it tracks normally and there is no infection, leave it alone. But if it is uh, infected then you have to saw it and maybe drill the pegs. If there is a femur, you need to define the femur, expose it to degrees. Use flexible osteotomes. Start from uh, you know the flange and go to the sides and to the posterior aspects. And using these thin osteotomes or flexible osteotomes or even giggly saw, you can take it out. And Professor Barrett from Southampton described the classic double mocking technique where you and your assistant use a punch on the medial and lateral side of the femoral component, hit it synchronously, and that seems to produce a vibration which removes the implant uh, nicely. And if you're wondering who is Professor Barrett, this is Professor Barrett uh, on my extreme left there. Uh, on my immediate left is Professor Noble from US and right is Professor Heyman Pandit from Oxford and Professor Barrett is the person in the last left. So further trips for implant removal, uh, you need to use a uterosal femoral extractor to do an inline extraction of the femur. Uh, take the tibial poly out, ideally take it out once the exposure is done, that's the first step. So tibial base plate, you know, you need to define it, this is the exposure and uh, define the implant in the interface. You can use a bread knife, saw or a flexible osteotome to go on underneath the uh, tibial base plate with the implant similar interface all around in this is the fashion. Postlateral carbon is very important, you can use geekly saw or narrow blades to reach this. Uncemented in, uh, stems like LCS are difficult to remove and sometimes you have to create a bone window below the implant and punch it up with a punch or use a tibial extractor to get it out. So whole principle is to minimize bone loss at all these steps. 
So what are the principles of revision totally replacement? First is to remove the old implant with minimal post bone loss, as I mentioned. You need to define the bone loss and classify it. You need to restore the joint line because you don't want to elevate the joint line, leads to patella baha, poor range of movement, and unsatisfactory patient. So you define the joint line by you know measuring 2.5 centimeters below the medial epicondyle, which is a constant landmark, or three centimeters below lateral epicondyle, or 1.5 centimeters above the fibular tape, which are all bony landmarks, or centimeters below the patella, or the inferior pole of the patella. Sometimes you can use a menstrual remnant from the previous surgery as the joint line um, marker. So you need to you know, balance the knee, both in flexion and extension, like in a primary knee replacement. You have to correct the alignment to seven degrees valgus. You need to put a stable implant, either post stabilized or various valgus uh, stabilized or a hinge implant. And you need to use a minimum constraint uh, you know, as possible, which is better than a fully constrained implant. Because this paper looking at minimum constraint, which leads to better soft tissue function, better ha happy patients compared to a fully constrained implant where the patients are not happy. Bone loss management, it is done as per the AORI classification or Anderson Orthopedic Research Institute classification. It's the same for tibia and femur. Type 1 defect is a metaphysical defect. Metaphysical is intact with uh, less than one centimeter loss of the bone. This can be filled with cement or bone graft or cement with a screw. Type 2 defect is a contained defect in the metaphysis. A1 involves single condyle, B involves two condyles. Solution for all these things is to use an augment with stem or trapezoidal metal core or metaphysical sleeve with stem. And type 3 defect is a metaphysical diaphysical uncontained defect where <clears throat> even the diaphysis is involved. So you are forced to use a tumor process or a custom hinge process or impaction bone grafting if you're good at it. A massive allograft if the allograft facility is available at your center. This is the AORI classification. You can see that the type 1 defect on the left side with cement and screws or minor bone graft. Type 2 A and B defects usually filled with an augment or with a sleeve or a, uh, uh, or a, a trabecular metal cone. And type 3 defect on the right usually filled with a uh, a custom made type of process. So, again, coming to type 1 defect, it's a healthy bone, normal joint line, rim intact, minor bone defect, filled with cement or moisturized bone graft. So, this is uh, metal is biomechanically better than cement in a type 2 defect, and whenever you use a metal, you need to use a stem. That is very, very important. In a type 2 bone loss, you know, you have a metaphysical damage in the involving one condyle in A or both condyles in B. Definitely, it requires reconstruction, restore this joint line with augments and stems, or sleeves and stems, or TM cone is a must. This is an example if we have a type 2 defect treated with metaphysical sleeve and stems. This type 3 bone loss, that is, bone loss extending into diaphysis. May involve the ligaments. Major reconstruction is needed, like a large structural allograft, or major augments, or tumor custom processes, or a more constrained implant is needed in these situations. This is an example of here are three on the left side treated with a distal femoral replacement, and on the right side treated with a proximal tibial replacement. So, the basic principles of uh, revision totally replacement or maintain the joint line. Address the tibia first because it affects both the flexion extension gap. And it also creates a stable reference platform for which flexion extension gap can be assessed. Then address the flexion gap first, then use a distal augment to bring the femur down to address the extension gap. These are golden principles. Trials are critical. You can see that the knee on the left side with trial is loose, it's hyperextending. On the right side, it shows good flexion, and you can see a distal augment being used there. You need to address the flexion gap first and address the extension gap with augments, as you see in the picture there, on the left hand side, where the gray augment has been used to crystallize or bring the femur down. Fixation, best is cemented fixation. Most consistent results is with uh, all comments in cemented 91% premier survival, uncemented across 70% premier survival. Uncemented long sense stems in femur lead to irritation of the anterior femoral cortex with the femoral bowing. This can lead to thigh pain. And sometimes it can force the femoral component to go into flexion 
because you're hitting the bone in the diaphragm, which is flexing the and making the flexion gap tighter. Other principles are stem stems frequently require a wide supracondylar fracture. This is particularly true of a PS design. It's also true when the pistol post arpents are used. Always use stems. This is a picture of how a stem is not used, but a distal augment has been used in the femur, and that's led to supracondylar fracture. Massive allografts, very useful if you have an allograft bone bank. They give 75% good extent results uh, in around 41 months' time, with a complication rate of 30%, as for the paper from Ilya. Some of the papers show 60% good to excellent results at around 10 years' time with 25% reoperation rate. So, the reoperation rate in allograft is quite high, between 25 to 30%. In summary, I would like to say accurate diagnosis of the failure of the total replacement is very important. Careful preoperative planning is important, particularly looking at the bone loss. Complete array of revision operands is a must before you mention it in these surgeries. We need to respect the joint line, we need to achieve a symmetric and stable flexion extension gaps. Even with significant mechanical problems, 75% good to extent results are possible. Avoid raising knees for which you don't know the cause of pain. So for such patients, you need to refer to your best friend. So let me go through some of the complex cases that I had to deal with after my return to India from the UK. This is a 66-year-old uh, lady who's 120 kg diabetic, who's operated by one of the top two orthopedic uh, orthoplasty consultants in Bangalore, Karnataka, a very senior surgeon. And uh, unfortunately, the knee got infected. He uh, did five more surgeries and he couldn't eradicate the infection. So he decided to leave her with no joint. She was in bed and stayed for nearly two years. At two years, her daughter came to me. And you can see that on the left-hand side, there is a primary implant put and how she came to me on the right-hand side. The challenges I had was morbid obesity. She was diabetic. She had a repaired quadriceps uh, rupture in one of the operations. She had five failed surgeries. You can see the multiple scars are marked in there. Yeah, and she had a gastrocnemius flap in one of the previous surgeries. She had a marker shortening by one inch. I think you can see my hand there showing the difference between the two limbs. And we needed a bariatric table and we needed a bold anesthetist to take it on. So what I did is uh, plan for surgery because that's very important. Aspirate to the knee, do E. coli. Plan to revise it in two stages, and um, you know. E. coli, we got the antibiogram and uh, I put an antibiotic load with cement spacer as you saw in the last picture. ESR, CRP came back to normal in eight weeks. Rias didn't show no bacteria. Second stage, I had to decide which hospital had to be a major setup. Uh, it was a combined plastic and orthopedic procedure. I had to get clearance from fusion, nephrologist, senior cardiologist, vascular surgeon, senior anesthetist. In second stage, the challenges were the type of anesthesia. So regional anesthesia pain and they had to convert to GA. The prolonged surgery lasting for five hours and maximum fluid shift. So this patient spent 24 hours in the ICU and went back to ward after that. Quality of cordyceps are poor and it had to be dealt with and there was many more challenges and I got a result like this. The picture on the right hand side used the RHK. And this is she, you know, 2.5 years after being a veteran. So this what makes you happy, not the amount of money you get, but you know, able to make quality uh, difference to the life of these complicated patients. Second complex case is a 50 year old female, she had not worked for two years again like the previous lady, literally carried by her son to my center. Uh, she's seen by a senior professor of orthopedics who had said, God help you, you can see the knee destruction, they're completely fused and dislocated. And uh, I did an open reduction of the knee and a radical debridement, put a cement spacer. All investigations came negative. And, uh, and uh, fortunately, I, I sent the uh, histology specimen to all infection cases. And the pathologist called me and he said, uh, Shrikan, this is uh, classic uh, tuberculosis. So I started on the ATT. So otherwise, I was in suit. And you can see how thin the bones are there. So they were very poor and uh, you know, they're not very compliant uh, as well for revision uh, knee. We had put a revision, it got infected, they were, they were in real soon. So they said, Dr. Shrikant, you know, we want to go for fusion. So I had to customize the implant and fuse the knee. And it went on to fusing six months' time with the additive which we had to be paid. She's doing good. 
So the take home message is revision knee surgery is a complex area of work and take from two hours to six hours. So one can run out of steam doing these procedures. So training is a must to perform this complex work to acceptable and high standards. So Steve DePanland is one of the biggest knee hip replacement surgeons in the UK. He only does primary hip replacement surgery. He described the PAL as a marker for putting the uh, hip cups. So all the revisions he refers to other surgeons because he's not trained in it. In the UK, all the infected revisions, you know, if they're in infected revisions, referred by even revision surgeons to other consultants who specialize in infected revision work. So this is the standard. So, you know, one of the corporates in Bangalore, you know, operating overseas patient, and the patient died on the table because the patient was cardiopath and the chief cardiologist was holding somewhere in the US. So, and this led to a lot of problem, problems. So, these types of surgeries are not to be performed by the novice by looking at YouTube and Unity videos, as uh, sometimes is a norm in some of the countries. Uh, because the Indian judiciary, particularly, is one of the most hostile judiciary you can ever find in all of the world. So, if things go wrong, you will not only be jousted by your colleagues, but also you'll be roasted by the judiciary. So, the popular saying in UK is that when in doubt, refer to appropriate trained specialist. So I thank you very much for this patient listening and I thank again uh, Meditube and Dr. Uh, Satish Bhatt for giving me opportunity to uh, present my views on revision uh, knee surgery. And I see all your support serve these patients better because they do deserve a good service. Thank you very much. These are my references for the talk. Thank you.